Um, Cynthia and I heard our next speaker uh, do a webinar on uh, whole grain innovation and trends in retail. And so we knew we'd love to have her at our conference and talk more about trends, uh, whole grain trends overall and in the food service space. So welcome to, re uh, welcome Kara. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, the walking clicker. <laughs> it's a trend, exactly. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Kara Nielsen. I'm a trendologist, uh, which means I spend a lot of time doing PowerPoints. Um, but I also worked in the kitchen for many years. I was a pastry chef in the 90s in Berkeley when the whole food movement was really gathering steam and coming up. And when I first moved there in 1988, I had been living in France for a while as a French student who didn't want to stop studying, eating bread every day. And I came to Berkeley and discovered Acme bread. And boy, was I happy. But it's a whole new world now. So we're going to talk about some of the trends on the horizon here. And I have to say, you're probably not going to hear a main topic that we haven't already covered. This is, we've talked about a lot of really awesome things. But what I'm going to do today is share with you some of the things that I'm seeing that I think are kernels for what's going to be growing in the landscape to come. And I ask you to think about, you know, we get a lot of information and we're always looking for like, well, what's the next thing? Well, let's think about how we can keep leveraging and tapping into what's really cool and valuable and the things we have and how that we see and expect them to move out and then how you can leverage them for your business, food service, uh, diet, all of these great things. Uh, this is a picture of Josie Baker bread. And like I said, I live in the Bay Area, so I'm very fortunate that I get to go and try some of these things when they're first coming out. Uh, bakers, artisans, food makers, restaurateurs, who are doing some very cool things that are now really having a big effect and rippling out across the country. But I know these things are also happening in other pockets, so I've been busy taking notes as I learn about them. So we're going to be talking about these five things, not surprising, but there are really interesting um, happenings in each area. And we're going to start off with the mill. And I was really excited to learn about Grist and Toll. This is an urban mill, the first one in 100 years in uh, Los Angeles. And what's so unique about this is it's like a storefront. It's a store where you can go in and you can buy the grain. You can also, of course, buy these grains online. But Nan Kohler, a former baker, is working with a lot of the growers along the West Coast, milling their products and putting them in the hands of chefs and consumers. And I think this is a real sign. We've talked about farmers who are milling. We've talked about um, various uh, chefs and bakers who are milling. I once went to Nelcote in Chicago a few years ago, and the mill is down in the basement in probably what was like a utility closet. We really need to start seeing these things so that people can get excited about them. And so when we think again about the theater and turning consumers on, it's putting these things front and center. And this is what's happening with Grist and Toll. Uh, using a lot of really great grains. I love this notion of flowers of distinction. This is moving beyond the notion of ancient grains, beyond this heirloom grain. We've already talked a little bit about how there's some problems with some of these, this, some of these terms. Um, Steve Jones told us about that, of this heritage is great, but we want to also be modern in other respects. So I think flowers of distinction is a great way of, think, of looking at that. And then here's another restaurant that is really founded around the idea of milling fresh grains and then turning those grains into wonderful foods. And it really helps me remember, you know, when I think about flour, even as a former pastry chef and baker, I immediately think about bread. But of course, we've seen all the wonderful foods that are have made with grains. And these are the things that are on the menu at Emmer and Rye. This restaurant is in Austin. It hasn't been open very long, but it's already getting a lot of press. Uh, winning awards. Bon Appetit put it in the top 10 new restaurants this year in an issue that just came out last month. And again, this is also part of this new grain economy or this grain, heritage grain network that we're seeing where the growers are connected to the millers, are connected to the users, whether those are brewers, chefs, bakers, 
um, Maltzers. This is a really exciting network, and I think we have to keep working on how to grow these networks, which of course are springing up around regional grain uh, crops and farmers who are growing grains. And you can see some of the wonderful dishes here. Uh, the calling out of the grain. It makes you wonder why it took us so long to start talking about varietal grains when we've been talking about different kinds of apples, different types of citrus on menus for years now, also crediting the farmers. Now grains are finally catching up in a bigger way. Of course, this is still very fine dining, so there's a lot of room to go and to see these types of trends move out into um, more chains and different kinds of restaurants that have a bigger reach. Some ideas for leveraging the notion of the mill here, and uh, I have a picture of, this is something that's in a Whole Foods grocery store in Berkeley, and it's a home brewer section where if you're brewing beer, you can buy your different grains for making beer. You can mill it right in the store. You can also buy some equipment right there. And I think what's really key about this is the access and visibility. You walk by this on your way to get your oats or some of the other grains and nuts that are sold in this area. So this all of a sudden is like, oh my god, what a great idea. I mean, we go to grocery stores. Many of us grind our coffee beans. We're used to seeing that grinder. Where's the mill? I've been talking about this for a while now, so I, this is a charge for our mill sellers here. Of, let's get into grocery stores and let this be on view and start becoming uh, a regular visible thing. I also think about pop-ups, uh, pop-up milling uh, events, very, whether they're in cafeterias or cookware stores. We're used to the whole pop-up concept. Retailers are using it like crazy, especially, especially around the holiday season. So I fully expect this notion of kind of the storefront pop-up station, maybe it's even a mobile station, is a way of getting people really connected to what's going on. And this is sort of what used to happen uh, in many, many years ago and decades ago around these community uh, centers of the mill and the, the uh, stone oven that uh, is in the center of town. Of course, the bread. There's a lot of amazing bread. We've been eating good bread for a long time now, although I still can't tell you when I leave the Bay Area and go somewhere. Um, I have a brother who lives in Highland Park, which isn't far from here, and we, go to, we went to a fancy Mariano's Bakery that has a whole oyster bar in the grocery store, and we were buying oysters last month, and I went to find a good piece of crusty bread, and I was so disappointed. That, so there's still so much opportunity, is the point there, of even really good bread in grocery stores. What we're seeing now is this trend, and, and I really have to say I believe this is very much descending from the work that Chad Robertson has been doing at Tartine for a very long time now. When, Like I said, I was a pastry chef in the 90s, and this is when uh, Chad and his wife, the pastry chef Elizabeth Pruitt, Chad was making bread in a stone oven up in Point Reyes Station, and they were bringing it down to the Berkeley Farmer's Market, and it was quite the cult thing. And I remember going to Mill Valley, and they had a small bakery there, and I was making a pilgrimage mostly for the pastries at the time. Uh, but now they are really, um, have been hugely influential. Uh, Chad spent a lot of time up in Northern Europe and Scandinavia and Denmark learning that kind of bread we were talking about that Cynthia mentioned of making bread out of whole rye kernels. Um, also putting all kinds of ancient grains in his bread. His wife, Elizabeth Pruitt, uh, became gl gluten intolerant, so she's now been working on a lot of pastries with alternative uh, grains, and the, their influence continues to ripple out. In Los Angeles, a new bakery here, Lodge Bread. Of course, three young guys, plenty of tattoos. Uh, many of them have worked in some fine dining places. They got really excited about what Josie Baker was doing. Of course, Josie Baker, also in San Francisco, influenced by what Chad was doing. You can always uh, connect the dots here. And so they've gone to LA and are op have opened this after baking for a year in a carport and learning the trade. And now they're doing these kinds of very dark baked loaves, um, fitting all these trends like we heard uh, the gentleman from Publican talk about yesterday, uh, sourcing their grains very responsibly, working with growers, the uh, Tehachapi Heritage Grain Project. This is the Wiser family in LA that are growing a lot of other things and now also growing wheat. And of course they have a toast bar, that wonderful trend of uh, putting everything delicious on toast. You see the cultured butter as well uh, and that real holy, very wet bread. 
But here's an inspiration. I was so excited to hear that La Brea is creating this reserve line. This is wheat with a purpose. Everyone's got their tagline here, um, but it's really helpful because it really shows that there's a lot of intent here. Uh, La Brea, of course, is a much bigger company than it used to be, but they have managed to create a relationship with a Montana wheat farmer. Perhaps some of you in this room know this person, Dean Folkwald and they are using different kinds of uh, grain that he's growing and creating these three styles of this reserve bread, basically talking, bringing to scale what we've been talking about. And it's so exciting when I see this because it means that where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, just as uh, Fusion was able to grow with its brown rice, um, there's some growing pains, but if you can find the source, you can do it. So I'll be looking for these types of breads, but it's a really good indication uh, that for food service and for large feeders, that these are opportunities here that you don't have to ignore. This is also something that was getting a lot of attention in San Francisco was the first baguette vending machine. So it's kind of taking it in a different direction. Um, and of course, it has a Frenchy name and it's owned by a Frenchman. So Le Bread Express, I guess. Um, is selling par-baked baguettes. I mean, these are the kinds of uh, par-baking that you would see in an in-store grocery store, but now they're being loaded into this vending machine, and they finish baking as soon as you purchase it. So I went to San Francisco, I live in the East Bay, and put in my credit card, and I could see that there's a couple of left. There were little indicators of how many loaves are in there and how long it's gonna take you. Um, and then you can see here on the one, two, three, and out comes your baguette. And I was really impressed. It was a pretty decent baguette. Um, my assessment, of course, it could use a little salt or salt and butter, one of the two. Um, as it cooled off, it got a little tougher. But I think if you had taken it home and eaten it with a big bowl of soup or a stew or, uh, or even toasted it the next day, this was very respectable bread. And now there's already a second bread vending machine. So thinking about some of the way to leverage this trend, the first thing I want to think about is bread as theater. And so this is the newest um, outing by the Tartine people. Uh, they've just opened the Tartine Manufactory in San Francisco in a very big space that's next to the Heath Ceramic Factory. And it is pretty amazing. So I wanted to be able to talk to you about this, so I went and waited in line 45 minutes so I could get in. Of course, the 45 minutes goes by really quickly because they have things to tell you about how it works. They give you a paper menu that you can fill out almost as if you were in a Japanese restaurant picking your sushi roll. They have a combination of breakfast and brunch items, pastries that change from the morning to the afternoon. Of course, they're bringing in lunch sandwiches, and they're going to continue to roll out different elements. And so you go in, and it's a large building where there are different places where you can go. Um, you turn in your order slip at a cafe counter, and then they also have a coffee kiosk. They have a bar area. And you can see there, see if I can work my pointer. I'm not sure which one's the pointer. This one. So there's Chad, and he's there. Here are his amazing ovens, and this is in the middle of this room, and it's all open, and so you walk in from the outside. Here you kind of walk in. Here's the stairway here. Here's, you're waiting in line. You go in the front, then you come up here. You have to walk back behind to the cafe, and so you know, you're standing next to Chad making his bread, and then here's the bread cooling on a rack, and uh, in San Francisco, it's really hard to get tartine bread because at the original bakery, they bake in the day and it comes out in the afternoon and there's a big line and it always sells out. So if you go to the bakery in the morning, there isn't any bread to have. So I was so thrilled um, to be able to have finally get some bread here and they're able to really grow. But this is turning into quite the hangout. So some of the other ways of leveraging this trend, you know, how can you bring some of that bread baking forward, let people take a look at it? What about a grain milling vending machine? How would that work? This is sort of building on our last idea, taking in the vending. Um, the mobile bread bakery trucks, again, bringing that bakery uh, out into the open so people can see it and get excited. And then again, using varietal grains and creating custom products for your customers in the way that you're always doing, but again, tapping into some of these really cool grains and bread styles. Here's some more of the things that um, are at the manufactory, including uh, buckwheat topped 
uh, fruit crisp that also had black sesame seeds in it. This is a sandwich here, and you can see the table of food that somehow I managed to taste and eat with a friend. All right, it was inevitable, right? We have to talk about the bowl. So yes, this is a trend. It is a very big trend. In fact, I would wager that this isn't, this is beyond a trend, and this is just the way we eat right now for a lot of different reasons. Um, this came out last week. Uh, very excited to meet Robin, who has one of these cookbooks here and who's here today. Um, I already had been taking snapshots of uh, bowl cookbooks that are already on display in various places around. And we know that this is really um, a fantastic way for people to customize what they eat, to take it somewhere. It's filling, easy to eat on the go, and it fits into both a lot of cultures and a lot of alternative diets. So if you don't have bowls or you aren't selling bowls or you haven't figured out what to do with the bowl, um, all kinds of inspiration and opportunities here to really leverage this. One of the caveats, I think if your bowl is too big, you're probably going to be eating too much food. There's a lot of food in those bowls, and when we think about portion control, how filling grains are, how many wonderful other things we want to put in there, uh, I would just throw that out as something to think about is how big does that bowl need to be? And are people finishing their bowls? What happens to the leftover bowl? Um, so these are things to think about as this goes forward. I also noticed that you can kind of mess up a bowl. And if you're making it yourself and you don't really know how much sauce or how are things going to taste together, it can get a little muddy. So just keep some of those things in mind. It doesn't have to be everything in the kitchen sink. It can be a really unique and super tasty bowl. The bowl is really just the new plate or the new sandwich. So the latest in bowls, um, you may have read about Itza. This is a San Francisco-based automat, basically. Um, a person from, a gentleman from a big design agency and a software guy got together and created this automat for today. How many people have read about Itza? So a few of you, and um, how many, has anybody been there yet? Of course, they're only in San Francisco. There's a couple, we've got somebody in the back. Been to Itza, we'll have to talk later about which bowl you picked. Um, you have to go at least once, but what I think is this one here is right next to the UC Berkeley campus. These people are going to be using this regularly. Again, the two that are in San Francisco are in places where there are a lot of um, people working, and so they come down for the lunch. In fact, they close at 5 p.m., so if you come to San Francisco in the evening, at this point, don't bother looking for them because they're closed. You'd think an automated place right, could be open, but there's a bunch of people behind that wall actually putting this food together. Um, so you order on the iPad, you wait for your order to appear, it pops into a little garage, and then it's a screen, so then the, it goes black and you can't see them actually putting it in, and then it lightens up and magically your bowl is there with your name on the screen, and then your name is on the bowl. And then inside, I took out the dressing. This is their um, teriyaki bowl, and it has um, mushrooms and wonton and edamame and cabbage, and it's on a um, fried rice mix. What's so interesting, and it took me a while to realize this, because of course the menu isn't on a big board, it's in the iPad, so you have to kind of stand there looking at it, unless you were smart like all the kids and already had the app loaded in your phone and you had ordered before you ever walked down there. Um, but there are, there's no meat in any of these things, um, which I think is also great, keeps the calorie count down, keeps the price down, but with all those wonderful grains, most of them quinoa and uh, a lot of legumes, you're getting your protein for the day. I think this is also a real sign of the times that certainly for millennials and busy eaters, um, this is totally acceptable and preferable. It's like, give me my bowl and off I go. Another new item in the world of bowls here is this food truck in LA called Pico House. And what was really interesting for me is, um, you know, the food truck trend has been around for a while. Again, it's sort of part of our food landscape now. Uh, this is a group of sh chef buddies. They actually all live in a house together. It should be a reality TV show, and who knows, maybe it is. Um, they're down in L.A., but they've been cooking at places like um, Blue Hill, um, Bestia in L.A. I mean, these are fine dining trained chefs who have gotten together because they share this belief in good food and good grains. And this is a very thoughtful grain bowl. This isn't the, oh yeah, we're going to do a grain bowl and we're just taking our rice and putting it in a bowl that we might have been putting on a plate. They have really thought about the grains. They talk about where they source them. If you go to their website, they have a whole story about each one, why they put them together. And they really want to focus on the fiber, 
the flavor and the goodness of this. And this is kind of all they do. To also show how committed they are, they also have the ugly fruit drink. I mean, these guys are very with it here, using ugly fruit in a smoothie or a juice. That's the only beverage they serve. And you can see from the menu here, they have um, each sort of like each person has their family heritage represented with a bowl. So there's a Robertson short rib and a Crenshaw meatballs and grandma's pork, union lamb, uh, pico veggie. So they definitely have taken this comfort food, uh, fancier food that you might find in fine dining and done a really nice job uh, on a food truck. So thinking about ways of leveraging a bowl here, again, you're probably already, I would love to know examples of, is there the build your own bowl bar, but with a grain choice? I think actually one of our presenters yesterday had a picture of the grain bar where you could put in and pick your different grains, which I think is a really great idea. It really helps people start learning about some of these other grains. And I can certainly see grain, um, companies coming in and even having grain tasting so people can get a sense of what these different grains taste like and what they do. Um, you can also help, help people create the bowl that's gonna fit what they're looking for. And then thinking about pre-cooked bowl bases for to-go businesses, if you're in the grain business of how can you help food service outlets, especially smaller ones who may wanna serve this, how can you give them a, a head up here? Thinking about the frozen grain bowls, we heard about frozen IQF grains. Uh, maybe this is something that's already happening. If not, it would be great to figure out, again, how to get more bowls in more places. And then also recommendations to your customers about how to replicate good tasting bowls, because again, I think it could um, easily go off the rails. I experienced some of that when I was trying to build my own bowl at Itza, and in the end I gave up and just picked the bowl that they had, because it was page after page of ingredient, you can't even remember what you picked before. So it does get a little confusing. This is a photo of seed and salt. This is a, a healthy dining, kind of a vegan, vegetarian, paleo, uh, kind of the new raw, sort of caters to everyone. It's a takeout shop in the Marina District, and you can see almost everything they have is in a nice compostable bowl. They have taco bowls, they have salads, they have breakfast, and it's just the, the, receptab the receptacle of our times. And then let's talk a little bit about the burger. Um, it was great to hear from uh, Tony from Be Good talking about his veggie burger, sort of gets you in the mood. And I've been talking about veggie burgers for a little while. I ignored them for a long, long time. Um, I'm not a vegetarian, and, and I probably had a veggie burger in the early days and just decided to give it up. But boy, have they changed. And there's a lot of news and trends around creating these really interesting veggie burgers. Um, one of the newest this year is coming from local, and this is actually not a veggie burger, I have to say. So these are meat and grain burgers, or burgers that are trying to be a little bit more like meat. And so um, if you've heard about local, this is a Roy Choi and Daniel Patterson uh, operation that's trying to bring, again, better fast food to underserved neighborhoods. The first one opened in LA in the Watts District. The second one opened in one of Daniel Patterson's restaurant spaces in Oakland in the Uptown District. I have to say, not an underserved neighborhood, but they are already working to bring different locals to other parts of Oakland and other parts of the state. And they seriously put in a lot of time in developing this food that is again, more healthful and more thoughtful. And so this is their cheeseburg. And it's interesting, I've had a couple of them and you, it really does, it doesn't taste like there's anything else really in it. But there is beef, of course, but also tofu, seaweed, and sprouted grains. And I'm not sure exactly what the grains are in there. I've been trying to figure it out. But the sprouted grain, again, not only in a way sort of stretches the meat, but it stretches the meat so that you're eating more healthier things and less meat, which also then goes back to eat, buying less meat and um, looking at a whole sustainability pattern here. So it's interesting how it works both ways. And I will say the bun again is, is really great and developed by Chad Robertson from Tartine Bakery. Um, over in New York, Momofuko Nishi is one of the first restaurants to be able to serve the Impossible Burger. I'm sure you've seen the headlines. This is certainly getting a lot of press. This is a Silicon Valley startup with a Stanford scientist and a lot of investment money that is creating, again, an alternative veggie. This one is a veggie burger, but they're trying to make it be like meat 
Um, there's textured wheat protein in there, along with coconut oil, potato protein, and heme, which is the magic ingredient that um, has sort of an irony taste that resembles more of a meaty, juicy, bloody burger. Um, all kinds of things to say about this, but it's definitely, certainly getting a lot of attention, whether you believe in it or not. Um, and at least everyone wants to try it a couple of times. So this is just one example of some of these sort of food plus tech items that are coming on the market. The other big veggie burger that's been capturing headlines this year and last year is from the Super Superiority Burger in New York. And this is a restaurant, very tiny restaurant, from a former pastry chef. It's all vegetarian, um, some of it's vegan, and this is their burger. It's a little mini burger, and it's made with uh, quinoa millet, wheat groats, or whatever grain is handy. So they have figured out how to do this, but they're using a variety of different grains. And actually in this one is not so much vegetables, but nuts and spices to really make this one happen. But again, lines out the door as people try to try this, um, including restaurant sh um, reviewers who are also really enjoying this, as well as the charred broccoli side that's available instead of any kind of french fry. And then I've also been really impressed in combing the aisles of the Natural Products Expos, looking at some of the natural and organic products that are coming out. And I think Hillary's continues to do a really great job with very tasty burgers. This is in the little more tradition of the burger patty, the veggie patty that you buy in the freezer section. But if you haven't checked on those lately, please take a look. There are new products all the time, and some of them have hemp. One, there's a hemp and green burger here that's quite interesting. This one has millet and quinoa, along with sweet potatoes and um, a lot of other tasty items. So again, this is, it's interesting how these um, topics just keep getting renewed and that this veggie burger, you think we've, we've heard the end of it, and yet there's always something kind of innovating on the edge. This is a burger from The Plant uh, Cafe Organic, one of the older healthy eating spots in San Francisco, and one of the first uh, veggie burgers to really kind of come out of the gate being different. Um, this, this opened in the early 2000s, and this one has beets as well as bulgur, mushroom, lentils, and cashew. So a little more old school in a way, but again, trying to create a dramatic and tasty uh, food item. So yes, it may be hard to believe, but veggie burgers are pretty sexy right now. So uh, if you have them on your menu, if you're trying to sell some, uh, leverage this, talk about these things, that this is something that a new group of people are discovering and getting very excited about. Um, what are some proprietary patties that you might be able to create or sell or um, produce for your customers? And uh, can you bring in some of these burger masters or take a cue from them to create these awesome builds? I mean, we know a lot about what the burger is, is the builds, and we're in a better burger moment. So all kinds of inspiration there. And also thinking about finding a local, f finding a partnership perhaps with some of these chefs that are doing, or like the plant Cafe Organic. Um, is there one in your town, a veggie burger that everyone loves? Can you talk to that chef? and leverage their capabilities and prototype a new burger and have some kind of partnership to add a little um, chef um, shininess to that. And finally, we're gonna talk about the grain. And you, that might be sort of the first place to start, but there's some interesting edgy things coming. And we've already been hearing this too, that we are really looking at grains in a much broader way uh, we have some wonderful leaders and bakers who are really showing us there's so much more. Now, when the gentleman from Data Essential was here yesterday, he had rye as the, in the ubiqui ubiquity phase. And of course, all of these things are well known. It's sort of talking about um, Japanese food and only talking about teriyaki. Once again, once an ingredient or food or a trend becomes ubiquitous, that doesn't mean you can't look at it again or try to leverage it. And what I've been seeing in this culinary trend space is lots and lots of conversations about rye. And maybe it even started with rye whiskey. But the rye has been a huge topic. I haven't heard us talk too much about it today, but we did hear yesterday about the rye. Um, and again, it's a little tricky. And when we were heard about the challenges in baking with rye, 
uh, yesterday, but there's definitely people working on it. So we have some key folks, Alice Medrich, who's a cookbook author with a chocolate specialty, but she's really branched out. And Alice is a friend of mine, and she was talking about this is kind of her way of approaching gluten-free. And when she tried doing gluten-free baked goods, which she was sort of loath to do, uh, she discovered actually the flavor. Same thing that we've been talking about, all these wonderful flavors that are coming from these different grains. And she got totally into it and produced this amazing book. But then also people like um, Claire Patak from the Violet Bakery, which is in London. Claire is from the United States. She worked at Chez Panisse. She knew Chad Robertson. I know it's getting to be um, a trend there to talk about Chad, but he was an influence for her putting rye in her brownies. And so earlier this year, you may have seen it, uh, the rye brownie recipe made its way through the New York Times and Bon Appetit and kind of everywhere. So I actually bought some rye and made the brownies and they were very chewy and really quite good. And, um, and the next step is to get some real rye berries and grind them fresh and try this recipe. But it's definitely something that we're seeing more and more. There's a rye chocolate chip cookie at Sycamore Kitchen in LA. Um, I was impressed to see this new Guinness beer with a rye pale ale kind of coming at it from the, the other direction. Um, I'm most excited, however, about the Great Northern Food Hall in New York. This is in Grand Central Station from Klaus Meyer. Klaus Meyer, of course, is the, one of the big brains behind Noma and the whole Nordic food movement that started many years ago already and continues to influence what we're doing here in the United States. He's moved here, he'd started doing some Danish baking and um, earlier this year I was at a pop-up bakery in Brooklyn trying some of these items and now he has opened his food hall that has a bakery section and a sandwich section and um, part of it, each section has a name, so there's one called Open Rye, which is serving the s'more broad on a sunflower seed rye bread. He also uses rye bread in a flatbread dough, and you can see on this photograph, these are rye crisps on the top of that s'more bread. Also, uh, and I know the sorghum people have, I've seen a lot of pu puffed and popped sorghum. Um, puffed and popped amaranth. This is a really fun way, again, to get people excited. There's a lot of snacking going on in this country, as you know, and um, puffing and popping, even things like corn, there's still news, there's still things happening uh, that are really interesting. Um, of course, the quinoa puffs is just sort of taking, we've been seeing this now in the better snacking for a long time, mostly with legumes, and now we're starting to see some of these ancient grains really step up. But these two in the middle, the savory yogurt snack and the evoke, these are two new snacks that are coming out on the natural market, both from New York. One is a um, Indian style yogurt, and that's like a puffed lentil and quinoa uh, little puff on the top that's in a container. So when you open up the yogurt, you can then th toss your puffs in and, and kind of like puffed rice and add that crunch. And then the evoke is sort of like a sp spoonable avocado smoothie, but it also has these little puffs, these grain puffs as part of the package. There's also a foldable spoon in there, so it's literally a grab-and-go snack where you can then take your spoon, add your puffs, and make your way. Um, I also love this Sun Popcorn ice cream from Jenny Splendid Ice Cream. It's a, it's a great ice cream shop in Ohio. They do a lot of um, uh, using ingredients from local folks, and this is where they get their corn, the Bjorn corn, this is a gentleman that makes the sun pop corn, and this gentleman pops it in the sun somehow, and then it goes into the ice cream. Um, really, really delicious. Just a way of showing you all the fun things to do with these grains. And then my last slide here is on the horizon grains. And of course, we've talked a lot about millet. Yesterday, we learned all kinds of things uh, about millet and how possibly one of these next grains, along with buckwheat and sorghum, there's a lot of contenders for the crown here. Uh, this is an interesting project. The Millet Project is a group of UC Berkeley postdocs and students who are growing experimental millet in California because they believe so much in adding diversity to our diets and to agriculture. What I think is really key here is that this new generation of very you know, young, very committed people are getting into this and getting into it early and really taking a chance. And so I think this is, to me, the indication of where things are going to go. A lot more people are rolling up their sleeves and joining you in creating this new grain revolution. I've also been talking about purple power. 
Um, I think we talked a little bit about black rice, of course. There's a lot of excitement around this. I was very interested to read about a professor at Singapore University using uh, the anthocyanins from black rice to create this purple bread, which helps change the glycemic index of the bread and make it make white bread or whiter breads um, have a lower glycemic index because of this purple color. And these are the purple rolls on the top here. But we're also seeing purple corn and purple potatoes as well um, in cereals and snacks. And then finally, Job's tears. I'm so glad that I didn't hear anyone else talk about Job's tears over the course of two days so I could tell you perhaps one thing that you might not have been thinking about. Um, some of the influencers and, and sort of trend folks, it, uh, kind of forward-leaning people, have been talking a little bit about Job's tears. I will say Bon Appetit did mention this. Uh, otherwise known as coex seed, Chinese pearl barley, hato mugi. It's more of one of these pseudo grains, more of the grass. Uh, but people like Heidi Swenson from 101 Cookbooks, she's an influential blogger and wrote the Supernatural Cookbooks. That's a bowl that she has on her website, also uh, Righteous Foods in Fort Worth, a restaurant using it in place of hominy in a soup. Uh, Baru in LA, if you haven't heard about Baru, it's another one of uh, Bon Appetit's new restaurants of the year. It's in Los Angeles, tiny place, two chefs. They are just doing amazing things, lots of fermentation going on. They're making their own koji with kamut, faro, and Job's tears, and then using that koji to make miso and other ingredients that they're putting on their uh, menu. So take a look at the Baru menu in a, of course, a uh, little shopping strip mall down in LA doing some very experimental food here. So ways to leverage the grains, and I wanted to close with this photograph of Hayden Flour Mills with their uh, varietal grain crackers that they are selling. Um, Red Fife, um, White Sonora, Emmer Faro, um, Bluebeard, Semolina, I think that's what that says. Um, in any case, just showing you these things are already happening. We're starting to see these varietal grains come out. Hayden Mills is a mill in Arizona. I think someone mentioned them. Um, they're in the forefront down in south, uh, re resurrecting this kind of grain mill behavior. So ways to leverage this. Let's get all varietal on these wheat-based products and start talking about what's in there. Uh, lots of places to dig for inspiration from history, from regional uh, cuisines from around the world for new inspiration for using these different grains. Also thinking about adding more nutrition. This is already happening, but we know that the gluten-free mixes, moving the starches out and bringing in more nutritious grains, but that goes for anything. Um, more, more nutrition in some of our baked goods would be great. Uh, how are ways to add more popped and puffed grains to salad bars, to hot oatmeal bars in hotels, to all kinds of institutions? They could be pre-seasoned for extra interest. Just think of like a seasoned crouton, but have it be a puffed grain. And then I'd love to see more dark grains, and I bet we will, with those good, good for you anthocyanins. And that wraps up some trends on the horizon. Thank you so much. Is there any questions? Um, I think we're going to move into a break. So um, if you have any questions for Kara, then please find her. Um, we're just going to take a quick 10-minute break and then meet back here. Uh, before you pick up and leave, um, I, we had talked on the first day about sharing on social media um, with our hashtag. So we have our Bob's Red Mill gift bag um, is Sue Becker. Oh, okay, right in front of me. Yeah, so you won, so thank you for participating. And yeah, so we'll see you right back in here in 10 minutes, so thank you.